Hello, uh, welcome to Phos4G. Uh, I come today from the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land and elders past, present, and emerging. I am Tisham Dar. I am the CIO at Aerometrics, and today I'm going to talk about virtual earths and where to find them. So we will start with the shape of things uh, for a very, very long time. Humanity couldn't move very far. Uh, we were, would walk places. Uh, yesterday I walked home for an hour. It took me, you know, 15 kilometers in an hour. So if someone went walking for three days, they would start seeing the shape of the earth. This day we have cars, we have aeroplanes and rockets, and we can really see the shape of the planet. So the shape of the planet is some would say flat if you are not going very far, something like this with lots and lots of features and mountains and you can come to the edge and fall off. This is what the whole turtles and elephants uh, on, on the flat earth people believe if you read Discworld. After a while people uh, looked at some shadows in some wells and considered the earth to be a sphere. Uh, the Archimedean solid sphere is a perfect shape and people believed the Earth was a sphere for a very long time until along came the theory of gravity and centrifugal forces, Newtonian mechanics, and there was a big debate whether the Earth looked like a lemon or an orange. And an actual expedition was organized to go and measure the meridians and see the shape of the Earth. And we sort of nowadays have satellites doing these measurements for us all the time. And we realize the Earth is actually neither and it's a very weird, lumpy, gravimetric joid. Navigating the Earth in for its shape is done by the stars, by the sun, by the magnetic compass. One of the biggest challenges in exploring the world before we could fly or go to space was navigating using ships. The British organized a prize called the Longitude Prize to improve the accuracy with which we could navigate the oceans. And this actually eventually led to the British naval dominance and establishment of the British Empire. One of the big things that came out of the Longitude Prize was the Mariner's Watch. So the Mariner's Watch, or no matter where you are, could tell the time at the Greenwich Prime Meridian and you could figure out using the sun and the stars where you are on the surface of the Earth. The idea of virtual Earths was first exposed to me as part of my traditional culture. I remember being around seven, eight years old. It was in the 1990s. There was a big TV show in India uh, called the Mahabharata. And it would show the big Indian epic in movie for the first time, had a huge audience. This was around the same time NASA was turning the uh, telescope around and taking the pale blue dot picture of the Earth. And I was a seven-year-old kid watching TV, and one of the scenes in this show was uh, someone, the child, one of the avatars, had eaten some dirt. And his mom asked him to open his mouth and show the dirt. And he opened his mouth, and in his mouth there was a spinning globe of the whole earth. And this was the legend of Krishna. And these days I can open my laptop and have the whole earth spinning in front of me. The idea of this spinning earth in a computer was popularized by Neil Stephenson in his now famous book, Snow Crash, which is, I sometimes feel like we are living in. And it was actually called Earth. And you know, one of the biggest software programs we use, Google Earth, the idea actually comes from Neil Stephenson's 1992 novel. After uh, being a child, uh, my involvement with virtual earths resumed when I was in uh, late in university. Uh, I was working for a boss who had grand ambitions of showing high resolution satellite imagery on a globe. So we didn't have much resources in the company to do this ourselves. I got involved with a NASA project uh, which was run out of NASA Learning Technologies in NASA Ames in Mountain View, led by Patrick Hogan. 
And this project was building a virtual earth around the same time as Google was acquiring Keyhole. Uh, the project was written in .NET and DirectX and was sponsored by Microsoft. Later, after Microsoft lost interest, Sun Microsystems took over the project and uh, was its way to showcase the Java language for gaming and uh, GL support. One of the biggest things that came out of Sun involvement and improvement of the Java uh, lang uh, language for GL support is actually Minecraft. Ken Russell worked on the Java OpenGL integrations and is still involved in this area. The Chrome browser has its WebGL support thanks to him, which I'll talk more about later. The project never really had commercial backing and uh, NASA shut it down after Patrick Hogan re retired. And Google won the Virtual Earth's battle first round. So the next battle I'm going to talk about over Virtual Earths is a much smaller one. It took place in the courts rather than in the, you know, uh, code spaces of open source developers and closed source developers. Um, this was a battle between a company that's still around, uh, Skyline. Uh, they have a Globe software called Terra Explorer and Google. Uh, Skyline built their software in the early days uh, to stream 3D models efficiently when there was no OpenGL support and graphics card support and they sued Google when Google uh, acquired Keyhole and came out with Google Earth. This case was settled around 2007 and Google won because the Skyline patent honestly was pretty vague. Uh, there are excellent write-ups about, write about this that you should go and check out. Um, this is something around software patents that uh, you know, open source gets right and a lot of commercial companies, are, including Google, are getting right these days because Google makes their money not on software patents, on soft selling software. They make their money on selling ads, on selling subscriptions to their cloud services, subscription to their APIs. So they don't really have an ownership of software. We don't sell software anymore. We sell the convenience of being able to use that software at scale. So yeah, so this battle was won by Google as well. We sort of come to the next battle, which sort of involves users. Uh, if, you, if you watch Tron, there is always this ongoing line, uh, fight for the users. So even if you build amazing technology, there are always users who will benefit from that technology or adopt that technology. You need to always consider the users. And uh, Google sometimes is not very good at fighting for the user. So there was a battle between Esri and Google in the enterprise space. And enterprise are the ultimate users of virtual earths. They would like to see all of their assets. If you're a building uh, owner, com owning company, or all their mine sites, or if you're a real, uh, if you're a local government, all of your local government in a virtual environment. So Google had Google Earth Enterprise as a service for a while and they couldn't advocate or manage their users effectively. Google makes most of their money by you know, productizing their users, uh, the users of the product, but selling a product to the users is not really Google's forte. So this battle was actually owned by, uh, won by Esri, the, the big behemoth of the geospatial space. And you can find articles online about the transition from the Google Earth Enterprise customers to the Esri customers. This happened around 2015. This sort of brings us to the latest and greatest players in the virtual Earth space, which is uh, uh, if you do any of this work, you will find is Cesium. Uh, Cesium I use Cesium from the very early days in its incarnation where it was used for satellite orbit prediction in SDK, the satellite toolkit. This was a very physics-based engine, but it did have a virtual Earth in it. But it also had uh, nuclear missiles and uh, spaceships in it. Uh, so the Cesium took a very radical approach for a commercial company, AGI, the builders of Cesium, chose to open source their engines and put a whole amount of development resources to make it an independent company that sort of self-sustains and creates a large user base and developer base in the open source land. 
And again, this is powered by the WebGL technologies that Ken Russell developed at Google. You can have a browser-based, fully capable uh, virtual Earth. The game is changing. The CZM has changed the game already. Uh, so there are game is changing also on the other side of open source uh, to create a really rich uh, movie quality uh, 3D renders of the Earth. Uh, you can do that in Blender using uh, things like Blender NC, which takes uh, weather data and makes it, you know, realistically rendered on a, on a globe. And the combination of these, the real-time rendering using WebGL and gaming-like technologies in the browser and offline rendering using Blender and similar open source rendering engines, really let you create a very high fidelity version of the Earth, uh, you know, a true virtual Earth. The specific case that I want to focus on with Cesium and the gaming engines is Cesium's collaboration with Unreal Engine. Recently, this happened. I worked a little bit on the hierarchical LOD support in Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine has gone a great way towards making virtual Earths visible where people can actually enter them and experience from a space level, from a sky level or a street level or within a shop level the virtual world. Uh, this is powered by a large community of open source developers. So the licensing is a bit different. Unreal Eng Engine is uh, open source software but with royalty based licensing. It has some uh, you know hundreds of developers, some 400 developers, 500 developers. CZM has some 200, uh, 250 contributors. Between them this is an ecosystem of uh, you know, 700, 800 developers building this amazing um, uh, virtual earth technologies. Uh, you will experience them on the flat screens, but soon you will be experiencing them on uh, viewers like the Oculus and Vive and things that fit on your face and truly entering it. I'm looking forward to the day when I can be in Ready Player One version of, of the virtual earths. Despite all of these advances, there is always this sort of, we are sort of in a financial interesting place on how to monetize the virtual arts. The, the earliest project we worked on, NASA World Wind, was a public good project for education. It never really had a monetization plan which led to sustainability issues once the sponsorships and funding ran out. The virtual arts are a creative uh, con uh, engine in some ways and NFTs are taking over in spite of all of the scam connotations. Uh, sometimes you have to step back, look at the NFTs and virtual worlds and consider things by uh, that Yuval Noah Harari talks about in Sapiens that we are sort of in a virtual world of our own imagination already. We have given value to things that we imagine have value and uh, the creation of another layer of virtualization on top of it makes you perspective on the imaginary worlds and think, uh, that we are already living in. This is a new beginning for virtual worlds. Uh, we will not be constrained to virtual worlds on flat screens anymore. Reality capture data will be even in higher demand to populate the virtual worlds. We shouldn't let a particular corporation uh, dominate it. Uh, Facebook, for example, recently announced that they're hiring 10,000 software engineers just in Europe to, to pursue their metaverse ambitions. I have a friend uh, uh, in the Silicon Valley. He used to work for Apple. He has the patents on the back of the iPad design. He's, he's a mechanical engineer. He recently got poached by Facebook to work on the, their hardware push. They made a hardware guy their CTO. I am I'm a hardware guy at heart myself and I'm an electronics engineer. I can really see the software companies of Silicon Valley descending into the hardware space seriously to build their metaverses, to get people hooked and stay in these metaverses all the time. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for the future. I'm a, I, I'm always <laughs> I always consider myself a futurist. I want to look ahead and sometimes there are dark futures and there are bright futures. I would like the open community due to their open mindset and making things better for everyone attitude. 
to find a sustainable way to make better, greater, stronger virtual Earths into the future. Thank you for listening.